Lawrence, uh, we have all known you for many years. Uh, and there is a group of very highly dedicated friends and allies of yours. And Dr. Everstadt, myself, and others are part of this group. I have to say that over the years, I have learned tremendously from you. You know, sometimes, I mean, sometimes, most, most of the time we focus on many other issues, but we forget about the issues that are so close to home. And this is what you do, you're a true expert, okay? I've got the mic and the podium now, I can tell you, brother, you must really write a book, because you have really written so much about it. Yeah, okay, I need to put you on the spot. But, you know, again, you have alerted us to so many potential crises that did hit us. Um, you have been very dedicated to your work. Um, sometimes you have been heartened by the support you have had. Sometimes you have been disheartened by the support you haven't had. And for that, I apologize. I should have done better. But, uh, you know, all in all, it's great to host you here. I know that you're having a couple of great events at AEI as well, Dr. Everstadt. So uh, I have to provide an introduction, although we all know you. Lauren Speck, our keynote speaker today, holds a uh, Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from UCLA and a, uh, a Jewish doctor, JD, from uh, Loyola Law School. He, um, he has lived and worked in South Korea for six years, Lawrence Wright, and uh, he has worked as a consultant to some of the major Korean and South Korean business groups. And he's here today because he's the leading authority on what we regard as the basically pro-North Korean movement in the United States. And you know, a lot of us are sometimes embarrassed to look this in the eye and say, well, you're learning from Lawrence, we are. Um, he continues to do this. He's been doing this for about 20 years, Lawrence, I guess, maybe more. Our discussion today is going to be our own Dr. Nicholas Everstadt, uh, one of the world's top demographers, uh, scholars, uh, not only, of course, HRK founding board member, but also the uh, Henry Wind Chair at the American Enterprise Institute, PhD in political economy and government, MPA from the Kennedy School, uh, AB from Harvard, um, widely published author, uh, Master of Science from the London School of Economics, uh, recipient of the prestigious Bradley Prize, and it's a true honor and a privilege that you're here with us today, and Lawrence, and I look forward to a great event. Thank you so much. Lawrence, please take the floor. I would like to uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg, my old friend, for your very generous uh, introduction and for uh, inviting me here today to speak uh, to the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, an organization which uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I support and uh, to a small extent have been uh, uh, helpful to over the years. And uh, I want to also thank your staff for uh, arranging and smoothing out this uh, this event. So thank all of you. And I also wanted to thank, of course, uh, Dr. Everstaff for coming by to, to this event prior to my, uh, my next ones at uh, his home base at AEI. Uh, this is actually the first talk that I will be giving uh, to a human rights group per se uh, about my field of expertise, the pro-North Korean movement uh, in the United States, uh, of which I consider one of the leading authorities, perhaps only by virtue of default, because there really aren't uh, really any other Americans who uh, for several decades have focused uh, exclusively or even partially for that matter on this particular little known but uh, fascinating and I believe important uh, issue. I've been researching, monitoring, exposing, and opposing pro-North Korean forces in the U.S. for these several uh, decades. And uh, uh, one of the questions I've always asked, particularly by uh, Korean audiences, is uh, how I first became uh, interested or involved in this uh, somewhat esoteric field of, uh, of research and study, and it actually stems from my time back as an undergraduate student uh, at UCLA when I discovered that uh, aside from some dusty old books in the library, people of, uh, who were uh, pro-North in orientation, there were actually some live professors there, including the, the Korean American in particular, who was, who was supportive of the North, and that's where I first came to be more interested in the, uh, in the topic. 
My sources of information, I should say, that I'll be presenting to you today are first-hand information, which I gather uh, personally, uh, reports from others, uh, confidants and, uh, and other experts generally in North Korea, journalists and, and experts, uh, online research, uh, consists uh, of uh, a lot of uh, what I do, and also reviewing the own words, the own statements of uh, pro-North Korean individuals themselves here in the U.S. Uh, it's a little known topic, a little known subject. Many of you may have not even uh, been aware of its existence, and uh, you don't need to feel too bad uh, if that's the case, because uh, frankly speaking, there are a lot of uh, Korea experts, even some quite, uh, some quite accomplished ones, who really don't have the, the topic on their radar screen, so to speak. Uh, of course, uh, people are well aware, uh, historically, of pro-Soviet uh, movements in the U.S. More recently, there's been a focus on the movements which are uh, sympathetic to groups and organizations, individuals who are sympathetic to the Chinese Communist Party, and those two topics tend to get much more attention than my little uh, niche field. Uh, there are some, unfortunately, I, I must uh, confess, uh, in think tanks, in academia, in the media, who uh, tend, for whatever reason, to downplay or dismiss or, frankly, even deny uh, the uh, nature or even the very existence of pro-North Korean forces, the pro-North movement in the U.S. And uh, it has been one of my goals to uh, to perhaps educate is to present to presumptuous of a, of a term, but at least to to put the the, the topic on their radar screens collectively. Uh, there's not much information, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why some tend to dismiss it or not assess its full importance. There's not much information about the topic floating around, either in print or, or on the internet. There are very few reports, uh, not really many academic studies or even articles uh, on the topic. Uh, furthermore, much of the information is in the Korean language. Uh, so that also presents some kind of a barrier to some of the folks here in the U.S. who, who uh, are not able to, to access that. Uh, there's also the problem, of course, that uh, the media, uh, to uh, some extent in Korea, but to a greater extent here, uh, don't really cover the issue too much at all, uh, being focused on some of the other uh, high-profile, shall we say, issues relating to North Korea, where they, they be economic, political, military, diplomatic, uh, etc. Uh, of course, there's some, uh, an additional handicap, I might say, is that there's some in the, in the ROK who tend to view it as a purely American issue, since after all, I'm dealing with the groups and organizations which do fun a function here in the US. And conversely, there are some Americans, including experts, who feel because it has to do with the Republic of Korea that it's almost purely a Korean issue. But uh, obviously, one of the reasons I'm here today is uh, that I think that uh, it is indeed a, an issue relevant to the US and, in addition, relevant to the ROK. Uh, and again, there's, there's been a problem of, uh, from my point of view, of a lack of attention or interest in this particular uh, topic, in addition to, of course, the denials and pushback from the pro-North Korean forces uh, themselves. Uh, I should issue a caveat before going forward, which is uh, uh, within the Korean American community, just as within the uh, broader uh, uh, community of folks here in the U.S., it's only a very small minority of individuals who make up the pro-North movement who are involved in pro-North Korean groups as I define them. Uh, I want to state that uh, I use the term movement as in a pro-North Korean movement because I wanted to stress and I categorized it as a movement because it is not really a, a, a haphazard uh, conglomeration of isolated individuals. It's a movement per se, because they have their own organizations and they're quite well organized, and furthermore, they consider themselves to be uh, an actual movement. I won't so much be focusing on individuals who uh, are uh, officially or unofficially working for, on behalf of the North Korean regime, uh, what we may uh, term uh, uh, spies, for lack of a better, uh, an old-fashioned term for it. Uh, but of course, there have been some in, in the U.S. and in other uh, uh, nations who have been charged and arrested for actually working for the North. But I would note that those uh, I'm aware of in uh, Australia or in France, 
uh, those individuals who have been arrested and charged, convicted of actually working for the North, have been drawn from the pro-North Korean movement. Now, I understand from uh, my readings in uh, intelligence and in the history of intelligence that that's what they call uh, bad trade craft, I believe. In other words, uh, the North Koreans themselves would seek to hire someone who was not associated with or known to be supportive of them. But it has been uh, my experience that uh, in the case of these uh, quote-unquote despise, these individuals who have been arrested and charged in the U.S. and other nations, they were strangely, oddly, counterintuitively perhaps, individuals who were actually involved in the, the uh, pro-North movements of their respective uh, nations. The pro-North movement is really comprised of interlocking and an overlapping network of groups and uh, activists. You'll find a lot of the people are involved with, if not members or officers of, some of the same organizations. Uh, they're highly motivated in their efforts uh, to variously promote, to defend, and make excuses for the North, some of them even fanatically devoted to the North, extremely well organized in terms of their activities, uh, well funded, they're funded through uh, uh, sympathizers and through some uh, uh, foundational grants which they receive, and they are actually growing in influence, which of course doesn't mean that they're about to uh, uh, create any shifts in U.S. policy overnight or over the coming weeks or months, but they are, in terms of a, of a base level, increasing their influence and have increased it over the past uh, couple of decades. And particularly in terms of Washington, D.C. lobbying, they've increased their influence just over the past couple of years. Uh, the pro-North movement uh, does enjoy some valuable support, aside from its core members and activists, from certain VIP individuals, influential, powerful people uh, in D.C. and across the U.S. who I term, who I term uh, enablers, enablers, because uh, these friends in high places of individual pro-North activists, who in some cases uh, are involved with pro-North groups, may not be uh, themselves personally in their hearts and hearts a pro-North uh, Korean, uh, but uh, nevertheless they do provide what the pro-North individuals themselves consider to be very valuable backing and assistance. Of course, there is also the situation whereby the previous uh, uh, government of the ROK, uh, uh, unbelievably, was actually uh, in some cases supportive uh, uh, both uh, politically and even financially of certain pro-North Korean groups and individuals uh, here in the U.S. I'd like to take a moment now to discuss, uh, perhaps uh, definitionally, um, to whom I apply the label uh, pro-North, because that's always an issue of, uh, of interest, sometimes even of controversy. But I'd like to say that uh, uh, primarily I apply it to people, uh, in the first case, to those, of course, who admit that, that they're supportive, uh, sometimes even admit that they're loyal to the North Korean regime, uh, believe it or not. Uh, I apply the label to those who, in some cases, have been listed by the regime uh, in terms of, for example, being invited to events which the North Korean regime is hosting in, in Pyongyang. I apply it to members of uh, groups which I consider to be pro-North and, of course, supporters and, uh, and officials of those groups. I apply to people whose views, uh, in my opinion, and um, hopefully in the opinion of any reasonable person would be considered to be pro-North, who engage in pro-North rhetoric, uh, which includes a, a, a good portion of, of double standards, one who engage in one-sided critiques, who will defend the North, perhaps uh, not uh, in terms exclusively of its system, but for example, would defend it in any case in its uh, relations with and its conflict with uh, the U.S. and the rest of the world. And uh, I also apply the label to those who maintain friendly ties to the North Korean regime, who collaborate with it, who are associated with the regime itself or against some of its agents uh, in the U.S., such as, for example, uh, uh, diplomats and other uh, intelligence officials who are based at the U.N. mission in New York. But I'd like to uh, make clear that this uh, is a spectrum. There are gradations of people and organizations within the pro-North movement, uh, ranging from the fanatically loyal to the fellow uh, travelers. The types of organizations, and I've referenced that uh, I'm dealing here with uh, individual activists who are members of organizations, the types of organizations have uh, 
a certain strategic focus. They engage in certain tactics and messaging uh, to the wider U.S. and in some cases to the South Korean uh, public. And that is, in one sense, how I uh, categorize or classify them, because their target audiences uh, differ. Some of them will appeal to uh, the Korean American community primarily, and therefore they'll operate in the Korean language uh, most of the time. Others seek a, a broader influence, and obviously, therefore, they will operate mostly in the English language, seeking to operate uh, what you might call the, the, the quote-unquote mainstream or broader scope of U.S. Uh, society, including uh, political, cultural, and media uh, circles. There are also two different kinds of uh, groups which I have uh, broken down the movement into. Uh, one are the, what I term, for lack of a better term, uh, the hardcore or openly pro-North organizations. And these are the ones which uh, uh, no reasonable person could doubt that they're pro-North because uh, in many cases they will even express loyalty to the North Korean regime, unbridled support for it. Uh, some of these groups, uh, or many, actually many of them, are the ones that operate in the Korean language, but some of them are also uh, your typical traditional Marxist-Leninist uh, uh, groups uh, of that nature. Uh, then there are the, the front groups, the front organizations, uh, meaning organizations which uh, uh, would speak in particularly to uh, mainstream or uh, hostile or neutral audiences or to the general public, do not readily admit and will sometimes uh, hotly deny that the label of pro-North should be justifiably uh, applied to them. And these groups are therefore able, by virtue of being uh, front organizations, uh, to have a wider impact and a wider influence uh, upon the American public, uh, media society, and political uh, circles. Uh, some of the pro-North organizations, as you might well imagine, are uh, leftist, far left, Marxist, Leninists. Uh, they are located in different uh, locales across the United States. Of course, there are certain hubs where they're most active, some of them being where there are large Korean American communities, such as in Los Angeles or New York, and others being, for example, here in D.C., the center of national power. Some of them have ties to the North Korean regime in terms of at least before the 2017 travel ban, uh, traveling there in some cases quite often, uh, but others have ties uh, via North Korean diplomats and intelligence agents uh, based at the North Korean UN mission in New York, where there are actually uh, one or two individuals always stationed who are from the North's United Front Department which is tasked with, uh, liaising with, uh, and assisting, and in a couple of cases even controlling, in addition to advising, uh, pro-North Korean uh, groups and individuals here in the U.S. with whom they're often in uh, communication and with whom they uh, collaborate and sometimes meet as well in person. Uh, these distinctions which I've made between the front groups on the one hand and the hardcore openly pro-North groups uh, on the other, uh, have been in recent years somewhat blurred, these distinctions. So they're not really hard and fast categories. They're subject to some variation only because uh, some of the front groups uh, have, uh, in, especially in recent years, been willing to collaborate in some cases openly with the more hardcore uh, pro-North groups by having, for example, a joint meetings, joint events, by joining the same uh, political campaigns and lobbying together, etc. Uh, then there are, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, useful idiots, the fellow travelers who will uh, go along with the pro-North forces, sometimes become uh, uh, members, even officers of their organizations, who sometimes, uh, in fact, in many cases, serve as a very important function uh, as window dressing, uh, providing the legitimacy of their good names and thereby buttressing the reputation of the pro-North groups and activists here. Uh, also, the front groups and the hardcore pro-North groups really do have the same overall goals, even if they speak in different terms and target different audiences and even uh, speak in different uh, languages. When it comes down to it, uh, they're both really on the same pages and working towards the same overall uh, objectives. 
Some of the Commonwealth groups are actually branches uh, here in the U.S. of groups which originate in the Republic of Korea and South Korea, uh, and that they have uh, Korean American individuals here in the diaspora who are members of uh, local branches of those uh, organizations. Uh, the front groups, historically, and this also uh, applies to the pro-North movement, uh, come into being and sometimes are, uh, are terminated and ended when they serve their purpose or when they're uh, involved with an issue which is no longer uh, of key importance to the movement. They're uh, quietly uh, shut down and new front groups emerge in their place. That's a historical pattern, actually, which we can see with the front-type organizations historically going back to the 1930s and 40s in terms of pro-Soviet uh, front groups. Uh, they also focus on shifting issues, uh, depending on uh, what uh, uh, Pyongyang is most focusing on at any particular uh, time, whether it be uh, uh, opposition to uh, the human rights uh, movement in the U.S., the North Korean human rights movement, whether it be a calls for a no preconditions a peace agreement, uh, whether it be a call to end uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, ROK alliance uh, writ large, or more specifically, joint military uh, exercises. You'll find in uh, reading their materials, uh, uh, particularly those in English aimed at the general public, targeted at uh, the people whom they seek to influence, engage in uh, what you might call word games, the parsing of words, the sophistry and, and euphemism, because obviously being front organizations, they seek to, to muddy the, the issues with regard to the basic nature of the, uh, the North Korean regime and its policies. So they will engage in such rhetorical thought in the U.S. to try and win over uh, individuals who consider themselves uh, uh, real politic uh, uh, advocates. Uh, but again, their tactics and their types of organizations do fall along the spectrum, and there are different gradations of the types of uh, strategies and tactics in which they engage. Uh, the types of individuals. Uh, is always uh, an interesting uh, question, one that I'm often asked uh, when I'm speaking in the ROK, what type of people in the U.S. are involved in these organizations, uh, particularly at the highest levels, the true believers, so to speak. Uh, some of them are just pro-North Korea individuals per se. They literally support, in some cases I mentioned, are loyal to the North Korean regime. Uh, then, of course, there are communists, uh, the Stalinists, and also the Trotskyists, Variety. The Trotskyists, the Trotskyists, of course, they have uh, uh, doctrinal uh, objections to the nature structure of the North Korean regime, but obviously uh, they will still support it in terms of its conflict with the West, in particular with the U.S. You have other far-left individuals, non-Marxists, uh, and dupes, a large uh, proportion, unfortunately, of, of dupes, some well-known, some just ordinary individuals. There are also opportunists. Uh, people who, uh, who want to make a name for themselves and uh, think that uh, being involved with the Pone Earth groups is a way to, to get their names uh, uh, in the papers, so to speak. Uh, there are uh, Korean Americans of the ultranationalists, what the Koreans would refer to as the Minjok uh, or Uri Minjokiri uh, variety, uh, who uh, uh, take a, an extreme left wing version of, uh, of uh, nationalism to be their, their guide star and therefore support the North as the true or the authentic representation of the Korean people, the Korean Minjo. There's some you know, isolationists, some of the uh, far left and some uh, of the far right who, uh, who have made common cause with some of the, the pro-North forces. Uh, in the religious world, believe it or not, there, there are some uh, who are supportive of the North, especially uh, adherents of liberation theology and, and similar uh, uh, doctrines. In the academic community and, and beyond, a number of pro-North activists including some of their leaders uh, of the front groups, are adherents of uh, critical theory, uh, especially uh, critical Asian theory, uh, critical Asian studies, I should say, which is a, a key branch of critical uh, theory in general. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that there are also racist, even neo-Nazis, uh, involved in, um, or those of racist and neo-Nazi views, I should say, involved in the pro north movement, which is reflected from time to time in their English language statements, but primarily in their Korean language statements, which uh, don't get too much attention. And likewise, uh, many of them are, uh, are advocates of uh, uh, conspiracy uh, theories. 
There are also some individuals, sadly to say, who may be motivated by blackmail in terms of having family members who are in the North, and therefore, because they want to be able, let's say, to visit the North or have their uh, relatives there not in any way uh, retaliated against or actually favored by the regime, uh, feel it necessary to collaborate in various ways with pro-North organizations. You also have your basic street radicals, the street corner uh, coffee shop revolutionaries, uh, there are a number of academics who are involved in the pro-North movement, as well as professionals, doctors, lawyers, uh, those kinds of individuals. Uh, some lumpen individuals, uh, uh, as, uh, as Marx would, would use the term, and miscellaneous uh, 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 folks who don't really do much of anything but serve in the movement. Clergymen, as I referred, as I referred to. Some in the media, uh, uh, both in the pro-North media, because there, the pro-North movement has its own media, but also some in some of the, the uh, left-wing media. Uh, a few individuals in business, especially if they have dreamt of or have, to some degrees, been engaged in some level of business when it was legal uh, or otherwise uh, with the North. Uh, and uh, there are uh, also anti-military uh, individuals uh, who are uh, supportive of the North because of their larger beliefs in what they term anti-militarism. And finally, there are some ultra-libertarians. Uh, and by that, I certainly don't mean the mainstream libertarians. I mean ultra-ultra-libertarians of the extreme right or the extreme left who are sympathetic to the pro-North movement. Their beliefs, uh, obviously, being supportive or sympathetic to or willing to defend North Korea, uh, include, of course, uh, adherence of the North's Chuche ideology, uh, it includes uh, people who are uh, advocates of uh, third worldism, tiers uh Marxist Leninists of the traditional and new left variety, far leftists who are non Marxist, uh, ultra left nationalists from the Korean Minjok type of perspective, who I referred to, uh, anti Americans, people who are just anti American, uh, uh, have anti Americanism in their DNA and they're critical of every aspect of American society, foreign policy, uh, etc. There are those uh, of the Pad and the Abosh, no enemies on the left variety, who were therefore pulled into and sympathetic to the pro North movement, uh, moral relativists, uh, historical revisionists, including some academics, uh, anti anti communists, people who don't consider themselves or who we, we may not consider bona fide Marxist Leninists or communists yet who are viscerally opposed to any manifestation of anti-communism or opposition to the North Korean state. They're supporters of the Chinese Communist Party. Because in recent years, there's been some merging or blending uh, of the pro-North Korean forces with pro-Beijing forces. Advocates of critical theory, as I mentioned, a part of which is uh, critical Asian studies. Uh, some, uh, believe it or not, feminists uh, you might not suspect, but there are some radical feminists who have been drawn into the movement. Even more strange, there are some LGBT individuals who you would suspect would be the last people who would be uh, drawn into this movement, but there are some groups which actually uh, have a majority of LGBT individuals considering the way that they would be treated if they happen to be unfortunate enough to live in the DPRK. Um, and uh, some of these groups actually uh, promote and engage in violence in addition to, as I referenced, being uh, uh, racist, using racist language and anti-Semitic uh, language. I referred to the ties uh, to the North Korean regime of some of the pro-North groups and activists, and I mentioned that some of them, uh, uh, before the travel ban, had uh, visited North Korea. There was one individual uh, uh, based in Los Angeles, where I'm from, who I believe up to 75 times had visited the North just uh, uh, during the uh, dating back to the 1980s or 90s. Of course, most uh, of the sympathizers have not visited quite that often, but they also have meetings with North Korean diplomats and agents in third countries, whether it be in Southeast Asia or primarily in China or, of course, in Japan with uh, Cho Sen Soro and Cho Chong Yun, the pro North Korean uh, uh, agency there in, in Japan. Uh, there are also, as I alluded to, North Korean agents from the United Front Department who are based at the North's UN mission in New York, and there are such agents posted overseas. So even though the travel ban is enforced, pro-North activists can meet and uh, obviously, commun obviously communicate with, uh, with pro-North uh, uh, intelligence agents based in New York and those whom they meet in third countries. Uh, some of them, as I mentioned, are actually on the list 
Some of the more uh, prestigious, uh, well-known pro-North activists, well-known to the North, that is, have been included on lists of people who were invited to the North or honored in terms of celebrations that the North is putting on. And uh, some of them have actually received uh, medals from the North, uh, decorations from the North, uh, in thanks for their propaganda work here in the US. There are a small number actually who, divide, who derive a financial benefit, for example, for helping to process visas to visit the North when, when the, such travel was allowed. Lobbying and influence operations is a major aspect of what I'd like to talk about and of the pro-North movement here in the US, because that's something that they've been engaged in intensively, particularly over the last few years. And by lobbying and influence operations, I mean uh, by communicating, uh, meeting with, and collaborating with on um, various projects with those North Korean agents whom I referenced at the North's UN mission. In addition, a major part is lobbying here in DC and of course at the regional offices of members of Congress, lobbying Congress and other administration officials against uh, measures which the North opposes such as increased sanctions or increased human rights pressure and legis related legislation, and in favor of uh, measures which are seen as beneficial to the North or which the North would generally seen as favoring, such as, for example, a no preconditions a peace agreement or the establishment of a, some uh, low level of diplomatic uh, liaison. Uh, there are also educational projects which they're involved in. They uh, actually have seen, in one case, developed their own uh, uh, curricula, uh, which I assume is for uh, secondary education to uh, uh, promote the pro North Korean line and to propagandize on behalf of the North. Media outreach is also a major aspect of their work. Some of them have friendly relations with some of the uh, the mainstream media reporters, both of the foreign correspondents based in Seoul and those obviously here in, in DC and in New York, uh, who perhaps don't uh, uh, realize the true nature of the pro North individuals with whom they are uh, dealing. They also, uh, as I alluded to, have among their number, number uh, several uh, VIPs, influential, powerful individuals who they actively seek to recruit because of the respectability which they garner. Uh, from, and the name recognition, which is uh, which, uh, therefore attaches to their cause. And these individuals have been uh, helpful to them uh, and serve as useful, uh, what we may term window dressing, in, in denying uh, their true uh, nature. Uh, of course, uh, this goes part and parcel with the deceitful nature, especially in terms of the front groups of their self portrayals, portraying themselves as groups which are only interested in peace and unification, and absurdly, as laughably as it may seem, some of them portray themselves even, even as human rights activists, uh, which of course is, is quite uh, nonsensical. Uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, the uh, late North Korean dictator, actually had written and spoken about the importance and the relevance of the pro-North movement in the U.S., encouraging uh, overseas Koreans, especially those in the U.S., from, from uh, being involved in, uh, in uh, pro-North organizations here uh, as part of the, uh, the United Front strategy of the North uh, overseas. Of course, the, the North had, at the time of its very foundation, experience with United Front tactics in their seizure of power uh, in the North in the late 1940s. They've applied the ground tactics to a United Front effort uh, linking up with a, a sympathetic or similar common cause type organizations overseas and here within the US with the assistance and advice and sometimes even under the control of the North's United Front Department and their agents here in the US. Just like in Japan, you have the organization Chosen Soren, uh, Chongryun, that uh, is uh, active in Japan with pro-North Korean forces here. There actually are also some pro-North forces here who are connected with Chongyun uh, in Japan because since the travel ban, pro-North individuals not being able to visit Pyongyang itself have to be content with visiting North Korean uh, officials both in third countries or visiting Chongyun and dealing with them as an agent of the North Korean uh, regime. There are also some organizations uh, which uh, are linked to uh, left-wing organizations and left-wing political parties in Korea, which have become active here, particularly in lobbying, 
which although are not themselves what I would label or characterize as pro-North, nevertheless are willing to work with and make common cause with some of the pro-North forces, even though they themselves, as I mentioned, aren't, aren't per se uh, pro-North, they're, they're linked up and allied with, uh, officially uh, or un really unofficially, with uh, uh, left-wing political parties and even former administrations in the ROK, but there has been collaboration between them, for example, in support of a no preconditions peace uh, agreement. Uh, having given you uh, what I hope is a, a decent overview and introduction to the pro-North movement, I'd now like to, uh, in conclusion, shift a little more uh, specifically to uh, the efforts of pro-North Korean forces in the U.S. Uh, oppositionally against the human rights movement and against the efforts of uh, people like uh, uh, Greg and his organization and uh, the North Korea Freedom Coalition and other North Korean activists against defectors here in the U.S. and in the ROK and uh, uh, their efforts in that regard. Uh, obviously, being uh, variously supporters, defenders, apologists for uh, the North, these pro-North organizations and individuals, uh, in some of their work, oppose the North Korean human rights movement in the U.S., of which HRNK obviously is a major uh, and leading and highly respected uh, element. They argue against North Korea human rights efforts, whether it be lobbying uh, here in the U.S. against the uh, North Korea uh, Human Rights uh, Act or against its, uh, its uh, sister legislation in the ROK, the human rights legislation which had passed there. Uh, they will slander North Korean human rights organizations, uh, the individual leaders of such organizations, uh, attacking them with various epithets ranging from uh, warmongers to, uh, to uh, believe it or not, racists. That's a completely absurd uh, accusation, but one which they hope will stick because, after all, uh, the permanent forces are in a rather difficult position because they must argue uh, against a cause which the overwhelming massive majority of people throughout the world, not to mention the U.S. would support, which is the struggle for human rights in North Korea. So they have sometimes have to come up with not only reasonably believable, at least to the ignorant or uninitiated arguments, but also they have to resort to the most uh, ridiculous calumnies, such as those uh, to which I uh, referred. Uh, these groups will exhibit a faux concern with human rights, pretending, sometimes labeling themselves uh, ridiculously as being in favor of the cause of, of human rights, and that's how they sometimes will deceitfully portray themselves when uh, lobbying uh, Congress uh, either against human rights uh, efforts or for other political efforts uh, related to uh, international relations involving uh, the North. They will uh, engage in this anti-human rights activity uh, by use of double standards. Uh, and they will um, apply completely different criticisms uh, to, uh, or actually they will apply criticisms uh, uh, to the US and not apply similar criticisms to the North, or in some cases, any criticisms of the North, or only those criticisms which are the most tepid and inconsequential in nature. Uh, omission is one of their favorite tactics, which is uh, quite obviously they don't dwell on the human rights uh, issues, the crimes against humanity regularly committed by the North Korean regime and its officials. Uh, that's obviously a topic, especially in terms of specifics which they would never want to touch on their own, except when they're challenged. And when they are challenged about specifics, something which they try to avoid at all costs, they will either make vague expressions of sympathy, uh, in some cases they'll resort to outright denials, or but usually it'll be uh, dismissiveness or downplaying, and they'll lapse into, into moral relativism. Uh, well, what about the concentration camps and firing squads we have here in the U.S.? Ridiculously, they'll try to claim, and of course, that, that will only uh, uh, appeal to a certain level of, uh, of uh, ignorance, and those who really aren't familiar with the nature of the North Korean regime and its, and its crimes, or are willing to believe the worst about, about our country and about other democratic uh, countries, uh, they will uh, justify, in many cases, 
the North's repression by pointing to what they call the Haska policies, the aggressive policies of the, the current South Korean government or past uh, governments which uh, were uh, which were uh, wary of the North and obviously of the U.S. government uh, in recent years. And they will say that uh, these hostile policies and imperialistic aggressions, because they do use the word imperialist and imperialistic, uh, require the North to take certain repressive actions in order to, to maintain their uh, security. Uh, they will counterattack with various libels uh, against human rights leaders and against defectors uh, trying to dismiss their stories or trying to proclaim that they're merely bitter individuals or trying to uh, otherwise discredit them. And uh, primarily, especially in recent years, they've been focusing on what they uh, term a peace first message, which is really a human rights last message in the sense that uh, they state, uh, which actually the uh, UN and US government, UN rights officials both have uh, dismissed as something which uh, is not uh, valid or justifiable. Uh, they would focus on peace being the absolute, almost primary concern, and they argue that human rights would follow inexorably from increased uh, engagement with the North and from setting up uh, organizations with the North and from even establishing trade with the North in addition to uh, what they call uh, ending all of the so quote unquote hostile uh, policies. And that is one of their major uh, arguments. Uh, but uh, of course, all of these really don't appeal to those who have a basic familiarity with the situation in the North in terms of its crimes uh, against humanity, against its own people, or against, or in terms of the nature of the North Korean regime. And by that, I mean the North's uh, frequent diplomatic deceptions, its, uh, its uh, habitual failure to live up to uh, agreements it has uh, made with regard to a variety of issues over the years, both with the ROK uh, government, with the US, and of course, violations of uh, strictures of the, uh, of the requirements of the international uh, community. Bobby Dr. Nicholas Everstall to take the floor. I'll take just one minute. Please remember, democracies do not claim to be perfect. We keep recognizing our human rights issues. We keep improving those issues. The only ones who can claim to be perfect are the North Koreans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Venezuelans, the Belarusians, the Vietnamese, unfortunately, South Africans are in the same category. You made a few very important points, uh, Lawrence. Uh, the LGBTQI community, we all remember the awful insults North Korean propaganda hurled at our good friend Justice Michael Kirby, who is a saint and a great jurist just because of his sexual orientation. Race? We remember the insults they threw at President Barack Obama just because of his looks. Uh, and you know, all of these groups pretend that this is hum somehow some safe haven for the LGBTQI community and people of other races. This is absolutely outrageous. So we are dealing with a regime that's committing crimes against humanity. And we, we do have to understand, as you pointed out today, and you're passionate, you thoroughly research these issues, that you know, there are these groups of individuals that kind of lurk in the shadows and are quite frankly sabotaging our work. And paradoxically, paradoxically, I think that now more than ever, we see this and we have to understand what's going on. You know, the Biden administration and the UN administration in South Korea talk about shared values and that's wonderful. Human rights is part of those shared values. There is a wonderful vision here. There's a wonderful vision in South Korea now we have to see that vision implemented and there are some obstacles in the way. So, you know, we'll keep working on that. Dr. Everstall, the floor is yours. Sorry, I just thought I'd take it. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, HRNK friends and uh, our internet uh, friends. It's a great pleasure to be able to comment on Lawrence Peck's uh, work. I've been waiting for this pleasure for an awfully long time. Lawrence, I think that I have been learning from your studies and your careful analysis um, for almost a quarter of a century now. 
think we first were in correspondence maybe around the time of the uh, uh, historic June 15th, 2001 uh, summit. And um, I fear that sometimes over the past uh, two decades, you uh, may have uh, felt like a prophet without honor in your own country. Well, I think that all of us uh, owe a great debt to Lawrence uh, and should honor Lawrence for his um, important path-breaking, uh, really detailed and clinical analysis of the pro-North Korean movement in the United States. I would say your work follows in the best tradition of people like Herb Romerstein, who analyzed the pro-Soviet movement in the United States uh, in earlier days before the unfortunate event of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, made uh, made all of that work a little bit, um, a little bit moot. Um, as you say, um, there are many features of the pro-North Korean movement in the United States that uh, bear a family resemblance to Comintern. There's the, uh, the Comintern, Leninist, uh, Ur formation uh, of these sorts of influence movements. And also bears some similarity to what Mao, uh, uh, as part of a broader family, would have called the uh, the utilization of the magic weapons, the United Front magic weapons. The, just to uh, state the obvious, the influence movements, the uh, utilization of friends, cheerleaders, useful idiots, and, and others in enemy countries is essential for weak, radical states because they need to try to either alter the policies of their adversaries, undermine the uh, support for, uh, for national security policies in their adversaries. And this is why, uh, why pro-NK movement, pro-Soviet Union uh, movement, pro-PRC movement, in uh, other uh, designated enemy states is so important for the regimes in question. Now, there is a important difference between, let's say, the common turn, or even between the CCP and the DPRK's efforts overseas. And that's that uh, finding cheerleaders for such an obviously unattractive poster child as the DPRK is a much steeper task than was for the Soviet Union during the Stalin era, Khrushchev era even. Um, I mean, it is true that under Mao and under Stalin, there were, uh, there were famines, just as there was a state-made famine in North Korea, or, um, albeit the only state-made famine in an urbanized literate society during peacetime, but there were famines in those earlier countries. There were uh, terrible uh, abuses of human rights in those other countries, just as there is in the DPRK today. The gulags in the Soviet Union, Galilei in China, uh, and just as there, uh, there's an archipelago of prison, political prison camps in the DPRK. But those earlier uh, regimes, uh, the, the, CC, the earlier CCP and certainly the CPSU, proclaimed kind of a universalist ideology. They had this uh, vision of a, uh, of a world revolution which uh, would offer something to everybody, no matter what their uh, ethnicity or nationality or station in life. That's not true of the DPRK. As, as, as we all know, North Korean ideology has mutated over the years towards a uh, adoration and a worship of a particularly unattractive family lineage, 
And, um, and it's mutated away from uh, universalist claims of world revolution, which we would have seen in the, uh, before the, around the time of the Korean War, towards something which, uh, well, the term national socialism has already been dibsed, so we can't call this national socialism. Let's call it racial socialism. So towards a narrow racialism. Uh, so how, do, how does one uh, promote uh, a regime with such unattractive uh, tenets? Um, it has been easier to do this in the ROK and in Japan than in the USA because there's large uh, minjok in the ROK to work with, this racialist socialist ideals. There is a, a large, uh, uh, ostensibly overseas Korean community, but now many generations uh, community in Japan, from which one can draw the Chosen Young. But reaching outside of ethnic uh, Koreans in the United States to non ethnic Koreans as part of this pro, um, pro North Korean movement has been a very steep lift. It's been a very difficult. But as we have seen, as Lawrence has shown us, it is not impossible. And part of the uh, part of the reason that it is not impossible is because I'd love to hear Lawrence tell us maybe a little bit more. If I can invite you to uh, tell us a little bit more about this, because there's been a um, what do you call a um, a united front, not just between different uh, types of pro. Uh, North Korean um, actors, but also different causes. The United Front with the uh, pro-North Korean groups and the pro-Iran groups and the pro-PLO groups and the pro-CCP groups and uh, and even with uh, pro-Kremlin groups. So you have this, um, you, you have so to speak, an alliance of supervillains that you see in the United States working on a very low level where you have not just uh, uh, people who are defending or cheerleading for the North Korean uh, regime, but who are anti-Israel or actual Jew haters uh, or um, uh, uh, proponents of the proponents apologists for the CCP and now for, of course, for the Putin government. As well, um, with the uh, with the new uh, diplomatic overtures between Kim Jong Un and uh, Vladimir Putin, I think the work for the pro North Korean movement is going to get even more complicated. Uh, already, we see that uh, the North Korea cheerleaders are uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil about human rights abuses in China. Apparently, uh, Xinjiang and the Uyghurs don't exist, or if they do exist, uh, we get into what about. But there's an interoperability in all of these things that we, uh, that we see now. Um, I have two questions uh, I'd like to ask uh, Lawrence to address, if he would. Um, the first is whether, in, Lawrence, in your estimate, has the, has the pro-North Korean movement gained strength and influence in Washington over, let's say, the last 10 years. And what would be your assessment? What would be the evidence for whichever way your judgment uh, leads in this regard? And the second question is, why are pro-North Korean cheerleaders, apologists, um, activists, um, unregistered foreign agents, why are they so interested in uh, ending the Korean War? Why are they so excited about the legislation in front of Congress today, for example, about uh, ending the Korean War? Um, I'm very interested to hear what you say. I want to congratulate you on, uh, if we could, we'd give you a Lifetime Achievement Award, but uh, we all are greatly in your service. Thank you very much. A little embarrassed by those overly generous <laughs> remarks, but I appreciate them nonetheless. 
Uh, I'll get straight to your points because I'd like to speak. Uh, do I have a few minutes to, to address them? Uh, on the issue of uh, what is uh, referred to uh, in a Swadizan manner uh, by the left as intersectionality these days, that's the buzzword uh, that they seem to use, uh, what, what used to be called by the Soviets uh, uh, international, kind of revolutionary internationalism, uh, uh, the, uh, that uh, is indeed uh, a large aspect, especially in recent years, uh, of the pro-North movement's uh, activities, uh, aside from the North, uh, per se. Uh, members of pro-North groups, for example, the group that I mentioned, Dodoto, they'll go to the Philippines, and they'll meet in the Philippines with supporters of the Communist New People's Army, and even with some of the Moro uh, factions there. Uh, they will send, again, that group, Dodoto, some of their members to, uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Judeo Samaria to meet with, uh, with uh, Palestinian extremists and supporters of terror groups there. Uh, they uh, just recently sent a delegation uh, from Nodoto, that uh, group that I mentioned, to uh, to uh, Venezuela. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the founders of the groups was an alumnus of the uh, the Venceremos brigades in Cuba uh, many years ago. That's all in issues uh, uh, which are uh, ideologically uh, simpatico with their view uh, uh, around the world. Uh, again, there's the issue of the, the racism and the anti-Semitism uh, uh, on their websites, particularly in Korean, but sometimes in English, when, when Christine Ong tweets, it's deleted, that, for example, a former admiral and former uh, U.S. ambassador to the ROK, Harry Harris, uh, has the views he has just because of his Japanese ancestry. Apparently, she thought better of that, or one of the people in her uh, organization said, you better take that down, which she did. Uh, or uh, or the even more extreme statement on some of the uh, the uh, Korean language uh, websites, whether it's Minjok Tongshin or Jamie Dong Ko Chan Do saying that uh, uh, Christianity and Judaism are evil forces and uh, the Jews are the children of Satan and that North Korea should use its nuclear weapons to uh, to eliminate Jewish capitalism and these kinds of neo-Nazi sounding uh, uh, rhetoric that one would see on their, the uh, some of the pro-North uh, uh, websites. Uh, so that, that uh, is a clear evidence of the, uh, again, to use the buzzword, inter buzzword intersectionality of, of these groups. Uh, the pro-Chinese communist uh, efforts of the pro-North groups is something a little more recent. They did not focus on that uh, over the past couple of decades, but it's something that they recently have been involved with, and that was highlighted by some of the recent media coverage by one of the extreme left, left groups' involvement uh, financially and otherwise with the Chinese Communist Party, the group I'm referring to as Code Pink. Uh, no one here is going to disrupt my talk today from Code Pink. <laughs> like when they try to throw blood in the face of Condi Rice or something of that nature, I hear it available, but uh, unfortunately no one showed up, so I can't ask the Code Pink leaders why, for example, uh, I believe it was in 2014, they attended a, uh, uh, a Holocaust denial conference in the presence of neo-Nazis in Tehran, those kinds of things, or why they stand outside of Walter Reed Military Hospital and shout terrorist, terrorist to our wounded, uh, brave troops inside. I, unfortunately, I'm not able to ask them that because they didn't send a, a disruptor today, but uh, as you, I, I just mentioned that because there were a number of uh, stories culminating most recently in the New York Times about the links which one of the uh, Code Pink uh, uh, leaders had to a, a major player in Chinese propaganda and uh, who was uh, uh, who was uh, who had established kind of a network in the U.S. of pro Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, associations, which he was helping to fund. Um, on the issue of uh, their increasing influence over the past ten years, I would definitely say yes. Even over the past. Uh, uh, five years, it's been increasing. Again, uh, not to be alarmist or to uh, or to uh, raise expectations uh, uh, that the U.S. policy will change, that they'll achieve any major successes. But if you look at them from a zero basis point, the fact that they do have this access, which they previously didn't have, have doors opening to them, uh, thanks to the support of some enablers who actually aren't pro north themselves, but help them arrange these meetings with administration officials and primarily with senators and members of Congress uh, to uh, argue against sanctions and to submit these reports funded by the, uh, indirectly through the Korean government against sanctions and in favor of, you know, preconditions, uh, peace treaty uh, with the North. And of course, when they go and they, when they meet with, with these members of Congress, 
uh, they, these pro-growth activists, uh, representatives of these groups, they do not portray themselves in an honest, forthright uh, manner. Of course, as every American, they have the constitutional rights to petition their elected representatives and to, to lobby for or against bills, but the point which gets a little iffy, legally speaking, is some of these groups uh, are, uh, I believe, uh, actually serving as agents on behalf of the North Korean regime and receiving direct guidance from North Korean intelligence agents based uh, in the U.S., such as I referred to earlier, the North's U.N. mission, agents of the United Front Department or Royal Station there. Um, and that therefore uh, their, their activities uh, fall into a much more serious and perhaps uh, uh, raise legal, much more serious issue and perhaps raise legal issues in terms of not being registered under FARA. And when they meet with these congressmen, they'll, they'll bring in, for example, that gentleman whose slide I showed you holding up the banner saying, uh, we intend to loyally carry out the final instructions of the great leaders. He's a, a pastor, a Methodist pastor, Yoon Yil Sang at KNCC. He was the, their chairman, but he was removed, uh, actually, uh, I believe, through the efforts, due to a scandal through the efforts of the North Korean UN mission, they replaced him, which indicates how strongly they're under the control of the UN mission. And they'll bring him into a meeting. Christiane, Christiane will bring him in, and she'll introduce herself as a peace and human rights activist, and she'll introduce him as a, as a peace and human rights religious leader, not revealing the kind of things on his website, such as, for example, we hope that the sound of the North's nuclear weapons exploding will be the death rattle of the big-nosed Yankees, written by the, the vice president of his organization. So there's a lot of deception involved in addition to some of the, the uh, if you legal uh, issues. So there is that increase in influence, certainly in terms of lobbying, because they do have some members of Congress who will speak at their events, and academics who will speak at their events, uh, which of course gives them a, a certain legitimacy which they don't deserve. And finally, uh, on the issue of the Korean War and why they're so keen on ending that, well, uh, firstly, of course, you know, it was the policy of the previous uh, Korean government, the left-wing government of the Moon administration, uh, to focus on that issue and to try and uh, uh, achieve that. But uh, uh, for their own sake, the pro-North Korean forces, uh, of course, are uh, really just reflecting the long-standing North Korean demand for the agreement to a peace agreement and the formal ending of the war uh, above and beyond the armistice agreement. You may remember, uh, you may recall back uh, as early as the 1970s, uh, the North Korea's uh, phony rubber stamp parliament, the Supreme People's Assembly, was sending letters to Congress promoting this idea of, uh, of uh, quote unquote, ending the Korean War and signing a peace agreement. I was looking at some old uh, English language Korean propaganda, uh, even from the, uh, the mid 50s, which was talking about the need to replace of the armistice agreement. They weren't as specific, of course, as they are now in terms of a, a full-blown peace agreement, but that's been a constant theme going back years, and it's, it's also in the works of the, the, the dictators of the North, whether it be Kim Jong-il or, or, uh, or uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, requesting the, that kind of uh, an agreement. And uh, uh, we actually have them on the record as to why they in particular, the pro-North activists, the pro-North groups, seek this. And that was uh, as opposed to their uh, talks which they gave and their presentations in front of the mainstream media or mainstream audiences about how they just uh, are supporting the peace agreement because they want to end what they call the endless war and they want to promote peace and understanding and reduce the level of tensions. As opposed to that verbiage, we actually have their true motivations on record because, for example, Christine Ahn, the leader of the Pono North Activist and the leader of, uh, of Women Cross DMZ slash lobbying arm Korea Peace Now, the one who had that relationship with the North Korean uh, agents, uh, previously and, uh, and more recently, uh, she has said, in, for example, in, in a YouTube interview with one of her comrades, when she could speak freely, that uh, uh, in one case she said her, her goal was to uh, liberate the ROK from the yoke of American imperialism, and more on point, she said that she hopes and her goal is that the movement for a peace agreement would be the first step towards the removal of U.S. forces from the ROK, which of course, in a practical sense, in a practical sense, would mean uh, the the emasculation, perhaps even the end of the of the alliance itself. Uh, of course, uh, she and other pro-North activists do not only favor the withdrawal of U.S. forces from the ROK; they uh, they advocate quite openly, when especially when speaking to comrades, the withdrawal of U.S. forces from the entire Asia Pacific region, including Hawaii, which they've been quite uh, explicit about. So uh, that is their motivation in that. 
let me thank our two terrific speakers. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? <clears throat> Lawrence, you mentioned today uh, left and right quite a bit. Uh, we run into the same issue. Uh, the far right, the far left, they're not friends of our cause. Uh, we have experienced this in particular uh, as we were trying, attempting to expand our social media outreach, our support. But speaking of left and right, uh, and I just thought of this, actually, I just remember this. Um, one of North Korea's most egregious human rights violations is North Korea's Chantibong Kwaliso, the political prison camp. There are anywhere between 120,000 and 200,000 being held, men, women, children, pursuant to the Young Judges System of Guild by Association. Guess what? The first time we found out about this unlawful imprisonment system, we didn't find out from a Korean from the north or south. We found out from a Frenchman, Jacques Sedio. In the mid 1960s, Jacques Sedio. A French Marxist and Ali Lameda, a Venezuelan Marxist poet, went to North Korea in 1966 to translate the works of Kim Il Sung. Now, Ali Lameda was the real thing. He had been a lieutenant colonel in the Republican Army during the Spanish Civil War. And he said something along the lines, you know, if Kim Il Sung at age eight was so wonderful, how come we didn't learn about him? And for that, they imprisoned him. They tortured them, and uh, eventually, actually, <laughs> our guy, Nikolai Ceausescu, the president of Romania, who intervened on their behalf because he was friends with Kim Il Sung, they let them go. Adil Ameda died because of the malnutrition and the torture. So, this is what Kim Il Sung and his regime did, you know, to a hero of the Marxist revolution, practically, who had fought on the Republican side in Spain. So, you know, all of these groups that claim to be this and that, you know, we mentioned uh, LGBTQI rights earlier. Uh, goodness, I should have mentioned women's rights. Women's groups claiming to be human rights groups when they're dealing with a regime that's raping, maiming women, especially those forcibly repatriated from China, performing forcible abortions, infanticide. My goodness gracious. So thank you for enabling us to keep our eyes open the bars. Questions, please, anyone, don't be shy, come on. I guess I have one question. Please, uh, Lawrence, Dr. Everstadt, or me? Uh, two of the, yeah. Okay, you want to grab mine? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I'll go first. Uh, this is Jun Young Jo from Yanan University in Korea. Thank you so much for your lecture. <coughs> uh, I think uh, these days, uh, Korean government and U.S. government is mostly focusing on the military deterrence against North Korea. They don't have uh, much interest in engaging North Korea. And uh, sometimes I think uh, you know, U.S. government is losing attention and interest about dealing with North Korea. Sometimes I think. And the uh, people in the U.S. are losing some kind of, you know, interest about, you know, uh, talking about the Wombia case, actually a uh, very brutal case. Yeah, so I want to ask you that uh, is this situation okay? And do you think the uh, US and ROK government is doing okay uh, about the North Korea policy? Yeah, that's my question. I see. Uh, well, it does seem that uh, we're kind of in a bit of a, uh, in terms of policy directly towards North Korea, on the one hand, we have this uh, uh, new and improved understanding between the U.S. and ROK governments as a result, as a result for example, of their recent uh, summit meeting and the lower level uh, uh, concerned officials, as they call their meetings, between uh, uh, President Yoon and his administration and, the, and the, between the U.S. and the U.S. government on the other side and also involving the Japanese government in a trial bilateral uh, form. So, uh, of course, there is a lot of attention on the military political uh, aspect of it. Uh, I'm hopeful that human rights will, uh, will increasingly 
become part of that dialogue and will be included in that dialogue because uh, uh, each of the three nations uh, have their own, uh, obviously, uh, uh, serious concerns about the crimes in the North. I mean, if you just take the ROK, you have, uh, you have the fact that there are still uh, uh, ROK citizens uh, uh, missing and unaccounted for being held uh, by the North, just like there are Japanese citizens likewise. And the U.S., of course, has its own uh, the human rights uh, concerns as expressed by the North Korean Human Rights Act, uh, uh, etc. Uh, uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, with the increased uh, publicity and efforts of excellent groups like uh, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea and Greg's work and the North Korea Freedom Coalition, uh, that, that these issues will be put on the table and highlighted. Some of my friends in Korea have made the point that it's extremely important because they feel that, uh, in their own words, it's the Achilles, one of the, well, one of the Achilles heels of the North Korean regime, and, and uh, not to mention uh, a moral imperative of us living in freedom to speak out on behalf of those who are not. I think that was a terrific answer to a terrific question. Dr. Eberstadt, I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Eberstadt, a few other board members, Colonel David Maxwell, um, Bob Collins, who's our author, Olivia Enos, formerly of the, the Heritage Foundation, um, Ambassador Joe Petrani, who led the US delegation to six party talks. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, Nick. Um, we have put forth a human rights upfront approach. That's what we need. <coughs> President Yoon Song Yeol has a great vision. That vision must be implemented. It depends a lot on the elections. Well, we don't take political sides here in HRK, but our politics is more through human rights. But in practical terms, a lot will depend on the, the South Korean elections in the spring. This vision must be implemented. I will say, maybe you want to quote me, uh, somebody like uh, Unification Minister Kim Jong-ho is trying hard to do something about it. He's trying to implement this mission. You know, there's bureaucratic inertia, there's resistance. Again, at the top level, there is this wonderful agreement between President Biden and President Yoon song yeol We see this great summit meetings. We saw the great uh, tripartite summit meeting with Prime Minister Kishida as well at Camp David. We need to implement, by all means, it's very important. There's something else we need to implement. We have prepared some pastries, coffee, decaf. Please do not go without tasting duck or bacon pastries. They're really good. A cup of coffee, a uh, glass of water. Um, you know, let me thank my colleagues. Yeah, Will, Mora, Kramer, um, Laura for preparing this event. Nick, thank you so much for having us with your presence. Uh, Lawrence, it's been a great pleasure. James, really good to see you. Great to see a scholar such as yourself take interest in our work. It's fantastic. Um, and um, thank you, Nathan. I hope you got it all on tape. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope some of you will be able to attend our next event tomorrow, full day event at the Hudson Institute event co-hosted with the SNU Alumni Association, the Hudson Institute, and, um, and also, of course, ICKS, the International Council on Korean Studies. We're having another event at HRNK with a very interesting group of North Korean ladies. Remember, women's rights, women's rights, women's rights. Extraordinarily important. Women are the ones who have taken the brunt of oppression, Women are the ones who have been trafficked. 80% of these KPs are women. You'll even have an opportunity to meet North Korean women who were in the KPA, the Korean People's Army, the North Korean military. Thank you so much for spending this very meaningful morning with us. We'll see you soon. Don't forget the pastries, please. Thank you. Lord, thank you.